Check, check.
Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming to this session. Um, really excited about this session uh, because it is uh, not a lot of representation of chronic pancreatitis in this meeting. And so we're excited to have the whole afternoon to talk about it. I mean, that's why it's so packed with a lot of exciting um, talks. So um, we'll try to move through them and maybe save questions for later on in the, um, when we have sort of the panel discussion, that'll be a good time. So if you have questions, try to store them away for then. And then we do want a lot of audience participation as well during the panel discussions, please. Um, there's a microphone there in the aisle. Um, my name is Katie Morgan. I'm a um, pancreas surgeon uh, in Charleston, South Carolina at MUSC. Um, and this is my co-moderator. Hi everyone, Danielle G. Peralta. I'm a surgical oncologist and HPV surgeon at Northwell in New York. So I guess without much further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. We have, um, I didn't, do we have five separate talks today? And, uh, and then we'll follow that with a panel. Um, so our first talk is uh, by Jessica Chaffee, who comes to us from Atlanta. Jessica is an HPB surgeon who practices at Piedmont Hospital, and she's going to talk to us about patient selection and non-operative strategies in chronic pancreatitis. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'm going to talk about patient selection for chronic pancreatitis and non-operative management. Uh, first, we'll begin with a definition or kind of overview of where things stand for chronic pancreatitis, as well as the current status of surgical management, followed by the goals of surgery. And then most importantly, uh, the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach that is needed for successful management of uh, chronic pancreatitis patients. So uh, chronic pancreatitis has kind of been redefined over the last 10 plus years into a pathologic fibroinflammatory syndrome of the pancreas in individuals with genetic, environmental, or other risk factors that develop persistent pathologic responses to parenchymal injury or stress. And common features which we can see of established or advanced chronic pancreatitis are atrophy, fibrosis, pain syndromes, duct distortions, strictures, calcifications, um, or uh, exocrine or endocrine dysfunction. And this can all lead to dysplasia or even pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. But what we know is that this is not a uh, kind of one and done event. This is a continuum that occurs over the weeks, months to years uh, for patients. And so we know that patients begin with um, being at risk for development of chronic pancreatitis then this is followed by the, the theory that there's a sentinel uh, acute pancreatitis event, maybe followed by recurrent auto, um, recurrent acute pancreatitis, um, which leads to early chronic pancreatitis and the release of chronic pancreatitis biomarkers. This may resolve or this may go on to development of established chronic pancreatitis, which is what we are more familiar with currently with acinar dysfunction, islet dysfunction, pathologic pain or, and or metaplasia and then uh, progresses over the course of uh, months to years into end-stage chronic pancreatitis with fibrosis, sclerosis, exocrine insufficiency, pain syndromes, or even pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. There are many, many factors that go into patients developing chronic pancreatitis, and those at-risk factors are varied. So there are toxic metabolic, idiopathic, genetic, autoimmune, or even recurrent and severe acute pancreatitis that can lead to obstructive symptoms. And all of these put together can develop into chronic pancreatitis or one at a time. And so based on this, we know that chronic pancreatitis, there is no one fits all approach because it's a very heterogeneous population of patients. Current surgical management of pancre chronic pancreatitis is varied. Recently, a study was published uh, from our colleagues in Italy uh, demonstrating the varied approaches even at two tertiary care centers uh, who specialize in pancreatic surgery. And even after the establishment of the European guidelines for the management of chronic pancreatitis and who should, would benefit most from surgery, these two centers had vastly different approaches in managing chronic pancreatitis. One center, in fact, after these guidelines came out, severely decreased their interven surgical intervention for patients with chronic pancreatitis, whereas the other ones increased following these same guidelines. And so even within centers uh, um, who are well-established, the who benefits from surgery for chronic pancreatitis remains really unclear. And this was also shown here in the United States um, 
uh, in 2015, and that patients here in the U.S. who were receiving surgery for chronic pancreatitis are the ones who are really a little bit more in your face. So it's the patients who are getting admitted to the hospital. It's the patients who have uncontrolled pain and patients who have uh, extra pancreatic disease, such as jaundice or gastric outlet obstruction. And those are the patients who are currently getting operated on in community and tertiary care centers, kind of all comers. So since it is varied, um, the approaches to who is actually undergoing surgery, I think it's time that we kind of stop and see what are the actual goals of intervention for chronic pancreatitis. And if you ask patients, what they are going to say is to stop the pain. That is their goal, number one goal. Um, when we look at other um, factors though, we also kind of want to restore their quality of life and restore their function. We want to optimize their endocrine and exocrine um, function, relieve any obstructions if present, and of course, prevent the development of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And so we need to actually go back then and before we develop all these terrible things um, that which is known for chronic pancreatitis, we need to go back and eliminate these patients who are actually developing established chronic pancreatitis or end-stage chronic pancreatitis. And so we kind of need to shift that paradigm. So how do we do that? How do we treat pain for patients with chronic pancreatitis? Well, there is no one fits all approach either for this because every patient is completely different. And in fact, patients are going to be varied over the course of their lifetime or over the course of their disease, their pain patterns are quite fluid. And so we know that pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis pain occurs within the pancreas itself with pancreatic neuropathy and neuroplasticity within the central nervous system. And one patient with chronic pancreatitis may have persistent daily pain that may then lead to episodes of pain over weeks or months. And they may even have months or even years of pain-free episodes that can occur. And that there is little association between the morphological characteristics that we see on cross-sectional imaging and pain severity that patients develop. A couple of more recent studies also show that earlier surgery may help ameliorate this pain. And by earlier surgery, they were looking at surgical intervention within diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis or about two to three years within diagnosis. And a randomized controlled trial recently also was uh, done looking at a role for pregabalin uh, for management of pain and chronic pancreatitis and was shown to be very effective in managing pain. But once again, there is no one fits all approach. So what is the current effect that surgery is having on chronic pancreatitis? It's been shown for a long time that surgery is safe in patients with chronic pancreatitis. It does not, um, it's feasible, it's safe uh, with acceptable rates of morbidity and mortality. But when we looked at patients who actually had surgery for chronic pancreatitis, this looks at patients in the preoperative setting and the postoperative setting, and they sent questionnaires to these patients kind of following up years afterwards. And what they saw was that recurrent chronic pain as well as the chronic intake of analgesias were significantly decreased in these patients. Good news, right? We are working, it, it is effective at stopping pain. However, diabetes, as well as enzyme requirements or pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy was significantly increased in the post-operative setting. So what does this mean? Our goals of intervention, are we doing a good job at stopping the pain? It appears that we are. Are we restoring quality of life? Who knows, because there really still aren't any good studies looking at this or that have evaluated this um, for all patients with chronic pancreatitis. Are we optimizing endocrine and exocrine function? No, we are not. So to further combat, I think that we need to kind of change our approach to the management of these patients with chronic pancreatitis. NPF has done designated uh, centers of excellence for pancreatitis and have found that there really needs to be a complete multidisciplinary approach and a team um, that includes surgeons, advanced endoscopists, gastroenterologists, interventional radiologists, registered dietitians, social workers, endocrinologists, of course, pain management physicians, genetic counselors, and primary care physicians. So what's the role of a dietitian in this? Well, for me, my dietitian plays a huge, huge role in my practice. We know that patients with chronic pancreatitis, even with no pain, need additional nutritional support. And they've been shown to need approximately 35 kilocalories per kilogram per day in order to restore their function. It's been controversial if whether or not this can be obtained by following a low fat diet. And for most of our patients, we tell them, no, don't follow a low fat diet 
what's more important is the calories. If you can do that by minimizing fats, that's great, but it's not necessary. Also adding in use of nutritional supplements. We put almost all of our patients with pancreatic, uh, on pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. We do not utilize fecal elastase testing for this because it is not shown to be sensitive or specific enough for patients with mild um, um, insufficiency. So instead we put all our patients on them. Some patients will benefit from the use of multivitamins and then our RD assess patients in clinic as well as afterwards. Um, so they follow up weekly and then monthly and so forth. And so this long-term follow-up is really beneficial to make sure these patients are actually improving. Additionally, our social worker plays a really important role. Um, and uh, number one in assisting in uh, enzyme funding because enzymes, even when you're insured are, are very, very expensive. They also help our patients um, find smoking cessation and alcohol cessation programs. They actually are trained to provide counseling and to help them establish care with PCP. So that way um, everything is not falling in our laps. And then we have a very close uh, relationship with our advanced endoscopists. They are needed to help with the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis through endoscopic ultrasound using following the Rosemont criteria. They're also needed to help with ERCP, both for lithotripsy, for pancreatic ductal calcifications, and or for um, stones with, or strictures within the bile duct. They can help with PD stenting, which we know has been shown to be effective in managing these patients long-term, and also help with management of extra pancreatic disease. And then of course, celiac blocks or neurolysis. So for our patients with chronic pancreatitis, it requires a multidisciplinary clinical assessment. We first evaluate for the presence of biliary obstruction or gastric outlet obstruction. And if the present, those patients then will go on to either get, um, GI or surgery, depending on which is better suited for them. We then go ahead and look for if, if there's any concern for underlying malignancy. This requires use of contrasted multiphase imaging serum tumor markers, and well as, as well as presentation at our multidisciplinary tumor board. They also require an assessment of the nutritional status as we uh, discussed prior. And then most importantly, we have to determine the etiology of the chronic pancreatitis, whether that re requires a referral to genetics for testing or tobacco or alcohol cessation. And that's because we know that patients with, uh, who develop pancreatitis are at significantly increased risk for pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer, while linked to pancreatitis, has several modifiable risk factors. And really that's our end game for patients. Patients may wanna stop the pain, but we would like to not only help patients uh, improve their quality of life, but we also wanna prevent the development of um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And so looking at that, there have been uh, several studies which have shown what are risk factors or modifiable risk factors for these patients. And I'll draw your attention to two that I focus on primarily with my patients. The ones that are highlighted here are the ones that um, patients may actually intervene on, and that is tobacco smoking, which increases the relative risk of by 1.7 of developing uh, PDAC or alcohol use. And so all of my patients, all of my patients with chronic pancreatitis, before I will consider any form of surgical intervention on them, have to quit smoking and they have to quit drinking. And I do test their blood for that, both in the preoperative setting and the postoperative setting. So this is kind of my algorithm for management of patients with chronic pancreatitis. First, we have to diagnose them. Then it requires their multidisciplinary assessment. If there's concern for malignancy, underlying malignancy, they go straight to surgery. If there's no concern for malignancy, we undergo physiologic and endoscopic optimization. And I use that until it doesn't work anymore. If the patients then have persistent symptoms, despite our um, gastroenterologist doing everything possible and despite optimizing their nutrition, quitting smoking and quitting alcohol use, will then go to surgery. If however, their symptoms have improved, even in the setting of having persistent changes on their CAT scan, these patients then go into long-term um, pancreatic enzyme therapy, nutritional support, and of course, annual or biannual screening, pancreatic cancer screening. And that's it, thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Next, it's um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Whitcomb, who's joining us from University of Pittsburgh. He's going to discuss the, an update on genetic factors and chronic pancreatitis. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, very nervous seeing so many surgeons around. 
and uh, very few gastroenterologists, but I hope you'll find the talk today very interesting. Um, I've just uh, become emeritus at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm now a consultant and chief scientific officer at Aerial Precision Medicine, so that's my disclosure. I'm gonna talk about when I was a young man, a young uh, faculty member, and uh, back in the day, you couldn't find online articles. You had to go to the library and go through these stacks of old journals that uh, were all bound together to find the paper you were wanting and then Xerox it. And I found a very interesting article uh, or journal. It was the Journal of Syphilis, a quarterly journal studying the prevention of syphilis. And uh, I thought that was quite interesting. And I'm showing the, the bacteria that causes syphilis here. Uh, what happened was in 1943, there was a discovery among four patients that uh, a um, treatment of penicillin could cure syphilis. And in 1954, there was a very interesting thing and that is the uh, American Journal of Syphilis came to an end and the editor said, it's cured, there's really nothing to write about, we're ending the journal. Now, that I think would be what we would like to see for pancreatitis journals. We would like to find a way to end this so that we have nothing else to talk about. We have an effective treatment. Uh, there's one tragedy though with the study of syphilis, and this was a study that was uh, done at the Tuscany Institute in Macon, Georgia, where in 1932, uh, uh, they took uh, 399 black males uh, with syphilis and 201 controls, told them they had bad blood and were gonna follow them prospectively. Uh, the tragedy was in 1943, when it was discovered that penicillin could cure syphilis, these men were never told about it. And finally, in 1972, the Associated Press published a paper and said, these men have syphilis, they're trying to find the natural history of the disease and they've been denied treatment. And that was one of the uh, greatest tragedies and completely changed uh, the way that uh, medical research is practiced. Uh, but there's still blad, bad blood today and African-Americans are incredibly suspicious of, of uh, medical research and do not participate. And so we know very little about the nuances in uh, black Americans. I'd like to talk about chronic pancreatitis today, and here's a couple of premise. The first one is that early detection and targeted therapy of chronic pancreatitis will prevent the development of a devastating chronic disease. Uh, secondly, that every effort should be made uh, to make a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis early and provide effective treatment. The third point is that chronic pancreatitis is not an infectious disease and the etiology cannot be determined using case-controlled studies. Multiple genetic variants determine chronic pancreatitis susceptibility, the rate of progress and complications, and the solution requires precision medicine. So what is the difference between precision medicine and what all medical students are taught by law which is the germ theory of disease and Western medicine using case-controlled studies. Well, in fact, what it is, is reverse engineering. It is engineering-based. And this is where uh, the specialized cells of a system uh, under pathologic conditions respond abnormally. And uh, it is because of an abnormal expression or function of proteins. So a specialized cell makes certain proteins on demand in the right amount. And if it fails to do that, then you end up with dysfunction. So we need to be able to understand how to do troubleshooting. And this is where we need to know what the parts are, what they do, uh, what the uh, mechanical uh, situation is and what we can do in order to understand why a complex system is not working. So troubleshooting in pancreatic disease, what are the parts, what are their functions, and what can possibly go wrong? Well, fortunately, the pancreas is very simple. It has two major cell types, uh, the acinar cell and the duct cell. The acinar cells uh, make proteins, and it's a very simple mechanism where they have the uh, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum making trypsinogen and the other pancreatic enzymes. The mitochondria is critical for energy, and calcium signaling uh, causes excitation, secretion coupling, but too much calcium can also trigger 
pancreatitis. Uh, the other major cell type is the duct cell, and we understand the mechanism is shown here. Uh, down in the bottom right, you see in blue the CFTR molecule, which is critical for pancreatic duct function. So in summary, the Asner cell is a protein factory and the duct cell is a fluid pump. And if one or the other or both go wrong, then you get pancreatitis. Now, the big breakthrough came through studying hereditary pancreatitis, and we were able to map the gene and identify it on chromosome seven in the middle of the T-cell receptor beta gene. So you have a genes within a gene, and it's very fascinating. Uh, trypsinogen is a master enzyme that controls all the other digestive enzymes, and so control of trypsin is critical. Uh, trypsin or trypsinogen is controlled by two cut sites by trypsin itself, two calcium binding sites. And when calcium binds in the activation side, it allows a second trypsin to come and to activate it. And the end turns inside like a key into a lock and turns trypsin on. So that's a calcium dependent process. Uh, secondly, calcium is also important because there is a second cut site, which is a suicide site where trypsin can come and cut the arginine uh, at uh, R122 and it eliminates or breaks the trypsin down and a second molecule called uh, chymotrypsin C comes and does a second cut. And so now the molecule is destroyed. So the trypsin actually activates itself and destroys itself. However, the second calcium binding site is such that it blocks the side chain from coming out and block CTRC. So in high calcium, trypsin is activated and not inactivated. And at low calcium, trypsin is not activated and is self-destruct, destroyed. So calcium is very important. So SPINK is a suicide inhibitor. It is a uh, acute phase protein. So if there's inflammation, the levels come up and it can block trypsin and cut it off. Now, there's a couple of fun facts about trypsin I would point out here from uh, my studies. Mice without trypsin do not get acute pancreatitis. Secondly, if you continue to hyperstimulate the pancreas, you can still develop chronic pancreatitis just by driving the immune system, and it's because it's the immune cells that are driving this under stress. Mice with the PRSS1 gate and function mutations, different types of knock in models, develop spontaneous acute pancreatitis, and the recurrent acute pancreatitis drives progression to chronic pancreatitis. And so this is a critical feature inside of, uh, that we learned from mice and it um, matches what we have in men. Hereditary pancreatitis is the caused by the gene that prevents the shutoff of trypsin. So trypsin can't be inhibited. And 80% of the people get acute pancreatitis, 50% get chronic pancreatitis, and many get uh, pancreatic cancer but the complications are highly variable. And in this uh, study, it shows that the onset of the symptoms occur at all different ages. It's not like you have the mutation and you're born with it. Half of them get it by age 10. And then later in life, some get maldigestion, others don't. Some get diabetes, others don't. And then more concerning at near the uh, later times of life, there's a rapid increase in the amount of pancreatic cancer. Amazingly, this is caused by smoking because if you eliminate smoking in individuals, and we did a 20 year follow-up study, it turns out the rate of pancreatic cancer is reduced dramatically. And so you see a gene uh, environmental interaction there. Now cystic fibrosis of the pancreas, which is the correct name of the disorder, is uh, another important model. And we know cystic fibrosis by all the organs that are affected uh, by this mutation. Now, it used to be death from failure to thrive. That's because the first organ to fail is the pancreas because the pancreas is absolutely dependent on functional CFTR. But if you can feed the baby enzymes from a pig, it can digest the food and grow and live. And then the other features are seen later on in life. Amazingly, there's over 2000 variants that have been identified in cystic fibrosis because it's a recessive disease and some of them make no protein. Others, there's a trafficking problem. Others, there's uh, no function and other problems. And they can be classified by the mechanism. The reason that's important is that we now can break down the different 
problems with the amount and function of CFTR and target those. And there's been a miraculous change in the life expectancy of people with cystic fibrosis, because if you target this molecule, the patients can get better. This also works with the pancreatitis. Uh, the problem is it's, the cost is $300,000 a year and it's not justified. Chronic pancreatitis, I'm gonna talk about recurrent acute pancreatitis, uh, the definition of progressive model that was beautifully uh, covered earlier. So I'll go through that fairly quickly. Uh, the first thing we see is that in hereditary pancreatitis, we see this model of acute pancreatitis, recurrent, and then chronic pancreatitis. But we also see this in alcohol and a portion of patients, about a third of them with acute pancreatitis get recurrent and a third get chronic pancreatitis. The thing that protects the other people from not progressing is not clear, but we're beginning to understand that. So recurrent acute pancreatitis is the major driver. Uh, we've talked about the definition of chronic pancreatitis in the previous talk in the progressive model and how we want to be able to make a diagnosis early. Uh, the precision medicine though is very important. If I look back on my career, I've had NIH funding, a couple hundred or 300 citations. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount, but there's no change in medical practice. And we are still with symptomatic treatment and the best option is TPIAT. But what we know is the mechanic, an average Joe can fix a complex car if they have the right tools, if they have the list of the parts, what they do and the mechanisms. Here's a list of the genes that we have, but what we know is which cells they're in and what they do. And so we can begin using this information to build models that will tell us exactly what's wrong with an individual person in which system and begin to reverse engineering. We've been able to cross the uh, valley of death by integrating the concepts of precision medicine. We're learning that there's asymmetry of information where the scientists don't understand patient variability, epidemiologists don't understand engineering, physicians don't understand genetics, insurance doesn't understand the value of genetics, and patients don't know there's treatment options, but they will shortly. All this can be integrated. There's also a problem of the last mile from telecommunications. It's easy to build a network from uh, uh, Las Vegas to Miami, but distributing it is a problem, but we have a solution to that, which came in 2007. And that is a smartphone because every physician, every patient has one allowing immediate conductivity. There's also barriers in information transfer being the right size, shape, and all of this can also be driven. And we've been able to use this to build real-time supports for patients. So now we see our model and we can pick specific things that we want to look at. So for example, uh, should non-alcoholic patients have their gallbladder removed uh, to prevent recurrent acute pancreatitis if no stones are seen? And the answer is now yes. You can reduce recurrent acute pancreatitis to 11% uh, with a cholecystectomy instead of 35%. Uh, but the problem is 75% of people got an unnecessary cholecystectomy. We can use information on a smartphone now that we have been working on in order to provide the information in real time to the physicians and the patients to make these decisions. And so now we know with acute pancreatitis, what is the severity? What is the differential diagnosis? And then in preventing recurrence in the top right, if there's gallstones detected, you take out the gallbladder. Uh, if there's not, then you can find out whether or not that person's actually at risk of developing gallstones to begin with, or if they have another cause. So in this case, the people that get surgery, the ones that need it and are gonna benefit from it. So in summary, success requires shifting paradigms from the germ theory to precision medicine. There are tremendous barriers from conceptual framework, uh, asymmetry of information, access to data, and those types of things. But uh, the short-term solution is to develop a complex, independent ecosystem that contains and connects all the pieces. And that's what I am committing the second half of my career uh, to developing. So when will we stop observing chronic pancreatitis and start treatment? And will anyone be left behind? We hope not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitcomb. Our next speaker comes to us from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. It's Dr. Gustavo Cohan, who's gonna to speak to us about resection for chronic pancreatitis.
Thank you very much for the invitation. It is very difficult to speak after Dr. Whitcomb. <laughs> well, I'm going to speak about resections in chronic pancreatitis. <clears throat> As we all know, uh, chronic pancreatitis is an inflammatory and progressive disease that produces replacement of the normal tissue by fibrosis. And this fibrosis may produce in the long term pancreatic insufficiency, exocrine, and endocrine. In this picture, we can see in the first one the normal architecture of the pancreas. In the second one, we can see a patient with chronic pancreatitis and mild fibrosis, and in the last one, a patient with severe fibrosis. This severe fibrosis produces structural changes in the, in the pancreas that can be observed in the imaging studies. So we can see here, we have in the, uh, an MRI with dilatation of the Wilson duct with stones in it. In the CT scan, we can see classifications inside the duct and inside the parenchyma. And in ultrasound, we can see a head mass with biliary stenosis and, and classifications. So which are the indications for therapeutic intervention in chronic pancreatitis? The first one, as it was told before, the severe pain that can be controlled with analgesia and with failure of other, of other treatments. Local complications due to fibrosis producing biliary obstruction, glomerular obstruction, uh, chronic cellocysts. And the third one is the impossibility to rule out the progresses of, of the pancreatic tumor. So it's very important to understand the mechanism of pain in chronic pancreatitis. We know that inflammation and fibrosis may produce pancreatic blood hypertension, and this produces neurostimulation and pain. And the other way of pain is that the, uh, the inflammatory mass may produce local release of cytokines and, uh, and other inflammatory mediators producing chronic perineural injury and pain. So according to the mechanism of pain is the surgery we're going to perform. If we have a patient with ductal and tissue hypertension, we need a decompression surgery like the free procedure or the parietal rochelle procedure. And if we have a patient with inflammatory mass that requires surgery, resection takes place. So resective surgeries are divided in pancreatectomy and this pancreatectomy, and these are the indications for WIPO procedure. The first one is the possibility to rule out the presence of a pancreatic tumor or carcinoma. Uh, another indication is a pancreatic head mass without ductal dilatation and pain, with or without biliary obstruction or duodenal obstruction, and some cases of growth pancreatitis. This is some examples. This is a 60 year old female patient with history of drug abuse and alcohol abuse, and she presents this pancreatic head mass uh, heterogeneous with the IV contrast that produces biliary obstruction and Wilson duct dilatation. Although this is not the, the typical dilatation of the chronic pancreatitis, uh, a differential diagnosis was pancreatic tumor versus chronic pancreatitis. So we performed the WIPO procedure, and the result was chronic pancreatitis. This is another example. This is a 40 year old female patient with history of three years ago of a gastric bypass. She didn't taste alcohol, she didn't smoke, and she presented this pancreatic head, uh, head mass with biliary obstruction. Here in the MRI, we can see the pancreatic mass in the head of the pancreas. And I uh, indicated uh, the Whipple procedure. Unlike the, the previous case, I did not think at all in chronic pancreatitis, but the result I was wrong, and the result was chronic pancreatitis. This is another example. Group pancreatitis can be easily diagnosed in, uh, in, the, in the CT on an MRI. This is a patient with uh, group pancreatitis and chronic dilatation of Wilson duct and pain. Uh, in my opinion, patients with uh, with pancreatitis and Wilson duct obstruction, the will procedure is a good choice. Uh, here we have the specimen where we can see the Wilson duct uh, obstruction and dilatation. This is another, another case. This is a patient of 65 years old with history of alcohol abuse and severe weight loss in the last six months. He's admitted to the hospital with acute pancreatitis. We can see in the MRI the inflammation of the pancreas, and also he presented jaundice. In the MRI, we can see the is a pancreatic ductal obstruction, and we can see also in the tail of the pancreas a small cystic lesion. Uh, ERCP was performed, confirmed when the stenosis and the stent was placed. The patient was discharged, and three months later, the patient was readmitted with severe pain. We performed another CT scan. Here we can see a diffuse enlargement of the whole pancreas, and we can see that the cystic lesion of the tail of the pancreas was three times bigger than the, the previous study. So uh, in this case, tumoral markers were negative, uh, autoimmune markers were also negative, and the differential diagnosis was a diffuse uh, adenocarcinoma versus chronic pancreatitis. 
Uh, the patient has severe pain, we indicate an endoscopic ultrasound uh, with the punction of the pancreas, and the cytology revealed no, no tumoral cells, and the patient continued with pain with difficult control. So we decided to operate the patient. This is the interoperative photo where we can see the heart pancreas. Uh, the interoperative cytology was also negative, so we decided to perform a left macrotectomy, resulting the cystic lesion and the tail of the pancreas, and to perform the cholecoidonestomy because of the stent of the stenosis. The, 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 this is the specimen, and the result was chronic pancreatitis with uh, pancreatic cellulosis. And for finishing, there's another situation that can be patients with uh, a, a pancreatic head mass with Wilson duct obstruction and clear signs of chronic pancreatitis. In this uh, situation, I think that the pre procedure is the best one, but another choice is to perform a Whipple procedure. There's a, a, an old study, but really nice, performed by Isbiki 20 years ago, comparing 31 fray versus uh, 30 Whipples. And he observed that uh, both procedures have equal pain control. Uh, both procedures preserve endocrine function, but the fray procedure has lower morbidity and lower mortality than the Whipple procedure. So for finishing, we can say that indications for a section are a few indications. Uh, there are three. First of all, the, when it's not possible to rule out the presence of pancreatic endocarcinoma. The second one, when you have pancreatic head mass with severe pain that cannot be controlled with a normal analgesia, and some cases of local complications and some cases of group pancreatitis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kohan. Next up, we'll hear from Dr. William Lancaster from the Medical University of South Carolina about drainage and duodenal preserving approaches. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, drainage and duodenal preserving approaches. Uh, another way to put it would be drainage or drainage plus resection procedures for uh, chronic pancreatitis. Uh, so the indications, uh, generally speaking, are pain, painful chronic pancreatitis with pancreatic duct obstruction, and the choice of operation depends largely on the pattern of disease. Um, uh, patients have duct, duct obstruction or duct obstruction with a diseased pancreatic head. The operations kind of fall into three eponymous categories. Uh, the PUSTO, which um, for the most part in the modern era, when we say PUSTO, we refer to a longitudinal pancreatojejunostomy, a, a FRI procedure or a Baker procedure. The FRI and the Baker procedure are uh, uh, drainage uh, plus resection operations. So the PUSTO or longitudinal pancreatojejunostomy is uh, for patients with pancreatic duct obstruction without significant parenchymal disease. Uh, the pancreatic duct is opened uh, along the anterior surface of the pancreas with the operative goal being to adequate, adequately uh, decompress the obstructed pancreatic duct. All uh, ductal uh, stones and debris are removed, and then uh, reconstruction is undertaken with a rude limb to the uh, opened pancreatic duct. And this is just a simple schematic representation, but um, in terms of technical complexity within the uh, confines of this talk, this one is um, the least complex in terms of just opening the duct and then sewing a root limb to it. Um, the PUSTO generally preserves parenchyma because it doesn't involve really any parenchymal resection. Um, it does provide adequate drainage of the pancreatic duct. Um, it can be difficult in, in situations where the duct is um, uh, dilated uh, to six to eight millimeters, but within a diseased pancreas, it can be difficult to identify the duct. That can be a technical challenge. It doesn't uh, address parenchymal disease. Uh, and then there are the uh, challenges. So there's potential for injury to the portal vein, uh, the splenic vein, the splenic artery. The FRI operation is a longitudinal pancreatogegenostomy that combines uh, local resection of the pancreatic head. Um, with uh, preservation of the duodenum. The, it's indicated for pa patients with a pancreatic duct obstruction uh, with a diseased pancreatic head, classically referred to as a pacemaker of the disease. It's similar to the PUSTO in that the pancreatic duct is opened uh, anteriorly and longitudinally uh, along the long axis of the gland. And then the anterior head of the pancreas is, uh, quote, cord or resected, uh, preserving the 
sort of peripancreatic rim and pancreatic head as well as the uncinate process. And then again, it's uh, uh, reconstructed with a root limb. And so here's a schematic. You have an enlarged disease pancreatic head with a dilated pancreatic duct. And then here the duct is opened along its length and then the anterior head of the pancreas is um, uh, resected. And then a, a single anastomosis covers the entire area of open uh, pancreatic duct as well as the head resection. Uh, comparing a fry to a pusto, generally speaking, the pain relief is felt to be superior to drainage alone uh, because again, removing the uh, pancreatic head uh, it does not require dissection of the pancreatic neck, meaning you don't have to get under the neck between the portal vein and the pancreas. Um, it is more surgery. It's more demanding technically compared to pusto. Uh, there's increased bleeding risk as you can, as you carry the dissection across the neck into the head. Um, the GDA is generally encountered and uh, ligation is, is helpful. And then uh, resecting the anterior pancreatic head can uh, carry it too deep, can get, lead to an inadvertent bile duct injury. And then uh, there's the beggar operation, which is a duodenal preserving pancreatic head resection with a pancreatic jejunostomy. Again, it's uh, indicated in patients with pancreatic duct obstruction as well as a diseased pancreatic head. Uh, the difference between the beggar and the fry is the pancreatic neck is divided and the anterior head of the pancreas is resected and the body and tail of the pancreas is drained with a pancreatic jejunostomy. It's uh, felt that uh, a greater volume of uh, pancreatic head tissue can be resected with this approach. So again, we have a, a, a diseased pancreatic head with a dilated duct and then and the pancreatic neck is divided while the uncinate is preserved the uh, majority of the pancreatic head is resected, preserving a rim of pancreatic tissue uh, adjacent to the duodenum. And then the uh, a rule limb is uh, again used for reconstruction. However, there's usually two pancreatic anastomoses, one to the uh, head remnant and also to the body and tail. And then there's a modification where the uh, same un operation is undertaken. However, the body and tail is drained with a longitudinal pancreatic jejunostomy, sometimes referred to as the PUSO, a beggar with a PUSO modification. And I think this uh, illustrates one of the important points about approaches to uh, surgery in chronic pancreatitis is that um, really these operations kind of exist across a spectrum. And um, you can encounter a situation where the planned operation is a, is a beggar operation and the uh, dissection is uh, too difficult to accomplish that and so sort of the next step down is to do something that resembles a fry operation so i think that while these are all classically described they're not necessarily discrete the advantage of the beggar operation is uh, increased uh, volume of the pancreatic head is resected uh, it is technically more demanding it does require a division of the uh, pancreatic neck and it, uh, it also has two pancreatic anastomoses It's difficult to compare outcomes uh, because there is disease variability and uh, there's also differences in surgeon uh, preference and experience. Um, I look forward to the case discussions to see the variability of uh, approaches that a lot of people in this room will take to the different cases. That makes it very interesting. But in general, uh, pain relief alone is thought to be better with the fry or better with the beggar as opposed to a fry as opposed to a pisto. Uh, endocrine and exocrine dysfunction are worse with a beggar and a fry as compared to drainage alone um, for obvious reasons that some uh, pancreatic parenchyma is resected. And there is data to suggest that quality of life is better with a fry compared to a beggar because of the uh, diminished or the uh, compare the relative uh, decreased uh, exocrine dysfunction with a fry while the pain relief is greater with a beggar. Uh, so in conclusion, really, uh, this is a, the surgical approach exists across the spectrum. Um, the, uh, you can have a planned surgical approach and then uh, what you encounter intraoperatively may dictate that you change that plan. I think each one of these cases is unique. There's a, a, a limitless variability in the, in the uh, way not only to approach this, but in the way these uh, present. 
And I think experience and practice are essential. Um, the, um, again, and this goes back to, uh, there's not a certain number of these cases that you can see where you won't see something that you haven't seen before. And I think that experience is really important for the best outcome for the patient. And then finally, uh, I think there is, you, you sort of requires a, com a professional commitment to chronic pancreatitis surgery to continually learn and to increase experience to, for the best patient outcomes. And finally, it's not necessarily something to dabble in because these operations can be quite dangerous. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, our next talk uh, comes to us from um, Dr. Kirchner uh, from Stanford University, and she's going to speak to us about TPIAT um, and novel aspects. Thank you very much. Uh, I have noted uh, disclosures. So, uh, as we discussed here already, there are multiple complications associated with pancreatitis, but what our patients really remember are the terrible pain uh, with the diagnosis. Again, uh, early management is medical endoscopic, and then the drainage as well as resection procedures are offered. However, some of those resection procedures are fail, and not, some of them are not suitable for particular disease, such as diffuse small duct chronic pancreatitis or acute recurrent pancreatitis. And eventually, as the disease progresses, actually you have an impaired islet cell function, and that uh, leads to the endocrine complications. So the total pancreatectomy auto islet transplant is kind of a Cadillac procedure for, to, for chronic pancreatitis. You take out the pancreas for pain relief. And at the same time, islet uh, infusion from the patient themselves is given to minimize the risk of diabetes. What are the novel aspects? Uh, well, some of them are surgical and IR, although there are not that many um, advances at this point. Centralized islet isolation facilities is something that's been discussed a lot more recently, as well as more so optimization of long-term outcomes, especially endocrine uh, function. And I will also discuss a little bit the survival. So since 1970s, when the procedure was initially introduced by Dr. Sutherland under the mentorship of Dr. Nigerian at the time, uh, there's definitely an evolution of indications such as not only chronic, but also acute recurrent pancreatitis, but also etiologies of indications. As you can see now, we're much better at diagno uh, diagnosing, for example, genetic mutations in those patients between the two eras. This is the both uh, patient populations from the University of Minnesota. Also evolution of patients. In 1977, the first adult patient was performed. However, now we're offering this procedure for both adults and children. And children do quite well in terms of discontinuing narcotics, as well as being insulin independent following the procedure, although this is pretty short-term outcomes only after two years, and also minimization of the hospitalization rate afterwards. This is a standard procedure, and of note, I realize different centers do it differently, but in, in terms of initially, the procedure was introduced as open. Um, this is a, a standard uh, resection that I would perform, total pancreatectomy, duodenectomy, splenectomy, and cholecystectomy. Uh, I'll, uh, pancreas would be sent to the local isolation facility, which we use, uh, had at University of Minnesota at the time. And uh, during this uh, uh, portion of the procedure, the reconstruction was performed and islets were infused into the portal vein once they arrive at the end of the procedure. Um, there is an evolution of surgical approach has been reported, uh, including laparoscopic approach, uh, very limited uh, with conversion rate of 10%. Also, several centers across the United States are performing robotics, robotic TPAATs. Uh, this was one of the earlier publications. However, it didn't really pick up most likely because of the extreme inflammation and scarring associated with the disease. And as you can see, the total pancreatectomy time was six hours in robotic cases. So it means that you have to wait a long time to send that pancreas out to your islet lab and they don't like that. They call you and ask you if they can go for lunch. So this is really limited experience with a very careful selected patients. And this is again, just surgical considerations. This was one of my patients six months before we did total pancreatectomy. As you can see, it's really bomb went out in his abdomen. And this is more sad case where actually the inflammation and scarring involved the entire celiac access and patient had a celiac dissection during the case. So we had to take a little step back and perform a jump graft in order to revascularize his liver and his stomach. 
Uh, so in the era of remote isolation, we have to think about several concepts. Pinterest comes out and then it's being sent out. So islets are actually processed either in the same day or overnight and maybe in even in a different state. So they're infused neck at the same on the same day again or at the next day. So it affects obviously question of islet quality, as well as mode of delivery of islets, as well as costs. So in terms of islet quality, this was a study from two centers that used remote islet isolation. Um, in this case, they showed, no, they showed no relationship between amount of islets that were isolated and cold ischemia time on the whole organ, as well as no relationship between the uh, endocrine outcomes at one year and the cold ischemia of the whole organ. However, when they compared those patients to the patients who received the local isolated islets, there were some differences in endocrine parameters at one year, and they were beneficial in patients who received local islets. Uh, in terms of islet infusion in the setting of remote isolation, mostly performed by IR, uh, in the IR suite where portal vein is being accessed and uh, in, under the fluoroscopy, and the islets are being infused. There are several other techniques that have been described. Uh, this is particular one, actually old one, which freaked out all the nurses in the PACU, but this, uh, uh, the a mental tongue is being left out through the three centimeter incision and the a mental vein is being cannulated once islets arrive back into the hospital and infused. And then incision is closed actually under local. This is what more is performed now, which is placing a catheter into the middle colic vein with selenite along the mesentery and then next day and taking it through the abdominal wall and then next day infusing the islets using the C-arm in the ICU and pulling the catheter in seven days. Um, in terms of the cost, and this is a quick survey that I did of my friends from five US centers. So this is what it costs to isolate islets if you have a local isolation. You have supplies, human resources, as well as the isolation facility maintenance. When you look at actually remote isolation, you have the same expenses plus the fee, which is usually about $20,000 plus transportation cost. And it can range from 1,000 to 50,000 if you're gonna fly islets back on a private jet from a different, um, from a different state. So the difference can be from 20,000 and up between the two. So islets obviously secret sauce. You don't isolate islets from this, you isolate islets from this in chronic pancreatitis. Uh, process takes about four to six hours, depending on the experience of the center, using the enzyme enzymatic as well as mechanical digestion, followed by purification. So the success depends on quantity, quality, and function. So quantity, it's been known for a long time, more islets you give to the patients, more likely they're gonna be insulin independent um, or over the years. Most islets are being lost during the isolation, but also they're being destroyed during the infusion into the patient through the insulin blood mediated inflammatory reaction. Some of the studies that have been <clears throat> performed more recently, looking at the anti-inflammatory agents to try to decrease this uh, reaction. Um, and it's been shown that some of the TNF inhibitors actually improve acute insulin, as well as C-peptide response at three months. However, long-term um, outcomes are not as good. So in terms of establishing biobank of auto islets, which means trying to save cells for, from patients themselves. So, um, this is one, uh, one of the one of the kind of investigations is actually trying to transdifferentiate exocrine tissue that's left from islet isolation into the endocrine tissue and administering to the patients as uh, de novo islets. Also, uh, probably now everybody in this room know about the induced pluripotent stem cells that were perform, uh, introduced by Professor Yamanaka in 2006, where you derive stem cells from differentiated tissue from the human, and then you can differentiate those stem cells into anything you want. And again, into the islet, trans, um, potentially into the islets. Both methods demonstrated efficacy in animal models. So far, no, there are no human studies in this. So in terms of quality of the islets, size does matter. Smaller islets actually do better and are uh, associated with insulin independence long-term, probably has something to do with islet revascularization. 
So one of the th ways to improve islet quality is actually introduction of pseudo islets, where the islets are completely dis distorted into the single cells and then reformed into the smaller units that actually have improved vascularization, as well as there is some evidence that there might be improved endocrine function. Lastly, the islet function. So we talked about infusion of the islets into the portal vein. However, there are obviously reports of different sites of infusion, including intraperitoneal pouch, as, as well as in bone marrow. So most common alternative site is the intraperitoneal or the mental pouch. And actually infusion, double infusion site is beneficial. And what it is beneficial for, it, re it restores glucagon response to the hypoglycemia better than a single infusion into the liver. Probably has something to do with the liver environment and met metabolic function. So in terms of long-term outcomes, well, I think we actually went a long way from the early beginnings. This is the study from Melina Bellin, where you can see improved uh, mental as well as physical components and quality of life in adult children. Again, children do way better. Uh, younger children do better even with a glycemic control, again, even up to five years. And this is a great paper from Cincinnati where they show that 75% patients are actually narcotic independent 10 years, which is uh, significantly better data than it used to, uh, that was reported by University of Minnesota about a decade ago. So in terms of long-term survival, two, uh, two papers that discuss this, both report survival between 60 to 70% at 10 years. And the major cause of death is actually is infection. Unfortunately, we don't know anything further about this. And this is where I believe there need, we need more research to understand the etiologies of infection and contributing factors, whether or not that's glycemic control in those patients. Is it recurrent cholangitis? Because some of those patients have recurrent episodes due to the technical or GI dysmotility issues. And lastly, we do know that chronic narcotic use actually modulates your immune system and increases the risk of infection. So in conclusion, TPIT became an acceptable procedure for adults and kids. In well-selected patients, our outcomes are fairly good. And the current research really needs to focus on islet longevity as well as long-term outcomes. So I'd like to thank some people whose brains I had to pick in order to put together this talk, as well as thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirchner. Next, it's my honor to present uh, the person who's taught me mostly everything I know about this disease, Dr. Nicholas Romsky from Indiana University will talk to us about what the future holds. Well, um, it's five o'clock on Saturday and 50 of you are in a dark room in Miami talking about pancreatitis. You guys are as crazy as we are on this panel. Everybody stand up for 10 seconds, please stand up. Let's get the blood flowing. This is a long panel. Yes, Katie. Katie and Daniel. Okay, sit down when you're ready. Thanks. This is power of the podium, guys, isn't it? So I have been given the easy task of predicting the future, and I appreciate the chance to talk to you, and especially with such an esteemed panel. These are really, really great talks. I'm looking forward to these cases. Um, I have no financial disclosures. My Acknowledgement is to Dr. Megan Lark, our IU surgery resident who has created some terrific illustrations, as you'll see. And my other disclosure is that these are just my thoughts. I don't have a crystal ball. I've taken care of these patients for 20 years. I've learned a lot from Bill Nilon, Charlie Fry, Hans Baker, others who are even in the audience. And what I wanna do is get you to think about some things. Where do we stand and where are we going? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about patient selection, a little bit about the concept of trying to interrupt or treat the neural pain pathways in pancreatitis, the intriguing concept of trying to arrest or treat fibrosis of the gland, the predominant problem. And also as Dr. Wickham so, so lucidly spoke of, trying to prevent or treat recurrent acute pancreatitis and thus interrupt the recurrent acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis progression. The overarching concept is that we really need to understand the disease biology better because we're only um, treating the complications of the disease. 
1997, Dr. John Howard, one of the fathers of pancreatology, told me we're not even at first base in terms of understanding this disease pathophysiology. And it's, it's embarrassing to say that here we are 25 years later, and maybe we're rounding first base thanks to Dr. Whitcomb's work and others. And I also want to commend this paper to you. Dr. Whitcomb published this in Pancreatology a few years ago, describing what it takes to get, in my mind, to second base here. We need innovation and we need hard work. Well, what about patient selection? This is a thought talk, so I'm not going to give you a lot of data, but I will tell you that the role of genetics and understanding better the genetic basis of this disease has transformed the way at least that I approach the disease over the past 10 years and 20 years. And we know now, again, we're just starting to understand this, but patient selection, there's no question is the key to getting good outcomes. This is a tremendously heterogeneous disease. One size does not fit all, and you have to match the proper therapy, whether it's resection, drainage, TPIAT to the proper patient. We know that even somebody with a really beautiful dilated pancreatic duct like this, who could get a very nice Fry operation or lateral pancreatic ostomy, if they have SPINC1 positive, they're gonna fail. And so this is something that we need to understand even more so in terms of patient selection. But what about the concept of trying to interrupt these neural pathways? The main reason that we, we operate on all of these patients, the, the predominant reason is for pain. So let's think about this from a different approach. What can we do to interrupt the pain, whether it's the inflammatory nature of the pain or the mechanical nature of the pain? We're starting to understand the concept of visceral hyper hypersensitivity a little bit more deeply. And so how can we leverage these types of things in terms of treating our patients? We know we tried some crude approaches surgically, both T.T. White in Seattle and my um, one of my mentors, Tom Howard in Indianapolis, and others have tried to cut the nerves, cut the splanchnic nerves, and we've tried celiac neurolysis, and we know that that's a temporary interruption at best. And sometimes that's important for the patients to get them over a hump, but that's not a long-term process. We need to do more work in terms of understanding the neural pathways. Well, what about the idea of treating fibrosis? We all think about fibrosis as scar tissue or something that when it's established, we can't even manipulate it. And I'll tell you, maybe we can, and we only need to look as far as our hepatology colleagues who have already advanced this concept into clinical trials. David, I know that this trial is a negative trial, but the idea is to try to illustrate the fact if we can adjust or interrupt the caspase, that's one spot where we could potentially treat or even soften up the fibrosis. Maybe we have a chance to do something like that. And finally, here's something that I think of as perhaps the holy grail of treating pancreatitis. Can we treat acute pancreatitis? Can we interrupt the recurrent acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis progression or continuum before it has a chance to get to the established fibrotic process. And Dr. Wickham, again, showed you very, very elegantly a lot of spots where this may be possible. Can we target some calcium channel blockers or in, in calcium channels? Can we prevent or treat acute pancreatitis? And again, we are not anywhere close to being able to say this is, this is mainstream therapy, but don't stop thinking about this and don't stop working about this. So here's the baseball analogy to bring us home, or at least around, the, around first base headed for second. This is my son, JR, who will be 11 in a few weeks here, actually. And so this is the uh, drill he's doing. I call it the burner because this is not fun. It's terribly painful. It's terribly hard work, but this is the work that we need to do. That's going to help us hit the ball. It's going to help us advance our knowledge around first base to second base. So thanks again, guys. I, I tried to keep this brief so that we have time to discuss some of these challenging cases. All right. Thank you, Nick. That's a great talk.
Um, we made up some time in the air, so we have a little bit of time for these cases. Um, I do want to thank the panel again. This talks were amazing and very well on time. I know that's difficult to deliver a lot of information in eight minutes. Um, so, so we'll have a few cases. So the first one, um, it's a 59 year old man. He was a former alcoholic now, um, not drinking. He is still smoking, however. Um, he has had a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis for about five years now, uh, marked by abdominal pain. He um, has had recent progression with three uh, hospital admissions in the last six months for pain and PO intolerance and has had a 25 pound weight loss during that time. And he's now, um, unfortunately, when he comes into your office, he's now been taking opi opioids daily. And so these are some representative cuts of the CAT scan that he has had um, and that he brings to you. Um, so let's see. So first, um, let's start with Dr. Chaffee, um, since you're the um, expert on um, decision-making and, and, and medical management. Um, what do we do first to start the sort of work up for this patient? Uh, well, first I would have a meet with a dietitian in order to help try to reverse some of this weight loss and optimize start on some pancreas enzyme uh, replacement um, and include a uh, possible feeding tube, et cetera, if he's unable to gain any weight um, with just uh, oral intake. And then uh, obviously counsel him on stopping smoking. Um, and I would wait until he does that for a minimum of about 30 days, as long as there's no underlying concern for malignancy, which I don't see based on this scan. Okay. Would you give him some pregabalin? Why not? If his insurance will cover it, sure. Okay. All right. And then I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Did you talk about enzyme replacement therapy? Yeah. Okay. On everyone? I do it on all, almost all patients who come in with, especially with any weight loss or things like that, because they're, they're losing weight for a reason. And most of the time that's because they are, have at least mild, um, insufficiency. Okay. Do you, um, see a uh, show of hands Does everybody in the panel routinely, um, do X current, but do pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Do you cater to resource ever, or take that into consideration? Yeah, I think that uh, some type of a pancreatic function test would be useful just to confirm that they actually have uh, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and also imaging is important to see if they have obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Uh, so those would be uh, what we would do before uh, starting pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Is there something that's easily fixable? And do they actually have uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? I think that uh, I don't know if this is on or not. The um, this is small duct calcific chronic pancreatitis. The weight loss. Um, I David is right on the money. I think in my practice I would make sure that this is EPI and not something else. The so weight loss obviously is concerning for um, malignancy potentially, and so um, I think it's useful, but not. 100% accurate to get a CA-199 for something like this. CA-199 can obviously be elevated in the setting of acute inflammation as well. Okay. Um, but I think that with with the story of the weight loss, and then again, I just want to, um, to, to say stopping smoking, like Jessica talked about, is really, really critically important. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody who, in, as a clinician, is taking care of these patients has seen people who, when they quit smoking, the pain actually does go away. You know, I've had people come in and, and not need surgery, believe it or not. I'm sure you have seen that circumstance too. Yes. Um, so anyone else on the panel, you brought up the rolling out malignancy. It is, it, how, do, how do you all do that? Um, it, Nick mentions the CE-199. Does anyone go further with, um, I mean, maybe contrasted imaging or, or even further? Um, Dr. Kirchner? So you always remember bad things that happen. Uh, I think Minnesota had one uh, metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer a year after the TPAT. So that, uh, that's why actually all the older patients, we are uh, 
we, we, we used to do, I'm no longer there. We, we used to do the screening for tests, AAC in 99 would be one of them and definitely contrast imaging, yeah. Okay. Anyone send for EUS? I'm sorry? Does anyone on the panel send for, or anyone in the room send for EUS endoscopic ultrasound evaluation? No. I do if the uh, tumor markers come back around, if a CA-929 is kind of above 200 or something, which is around what I would think might be acceptable for pancreatitis or inf chronic inflammation. So if it's above that and I have a high suspicion for underlying malignancy, I'll send them for uh, EUS to evaluate for a mass that we aren't able to see on our imaging. And then, you know, he's got small duct disease. Does anybody consider a referral for endoscop a trial of endoscopic management? Without a discrete stricture or a target, I think it's probably not warranted at this point. Um, I, you know, the, the specter of a cancer is something that we always have to keep in mind and mm. is so incredibly challenging to diagnose. Yeah. So the question about EUS, EUS in the setting of calcium in the head like this is really limited in terms of, you know, I'm obviously not an endoscopist, but um, that's a major challenge or trying to diagnose cancer, even in the highest risk populations, as you know, I, from all the CAPS-5 data and, and others. And uh, Rachel Kim from our group has a, a great paper coincidentally happening right next door about trying to find cancers in, in the setting of IPMN and um, genetic, you know, genetic mutations for, for pancreatitis. I'd like to ask Dr. Wickham, what, what's the role potential role of precision medicine in this patient population in terms of trying to diagnose the cancer. Can I do that, Katie? I guess I already did. Yeah, that was my next question. Does he need genetic testing? Yeah, so um, uh, genetic testing can play a role. First thing you want to know is whether or not the patient uh, actually makes a CA-19 or 9 or not. So foot 2 and foot 3 are key um, enzymes that put the classylation on the CA-19-9 and, and uh, about 20, excuse me, about 15% don't even make a uh, significant CA-19-9 and 10% secrete it. So your levels are normally high. So you'd like to know exactly what your, your baseline is and how to follow it. Uh, the second thing is you want to know is if they uh, have a high polygenic risk score for pancreatic cancer or a family history uh, carrying some of the genes that also predispose them to pancreatic cancer. And so uh, the, the issue for, for those is cost and timing. And so, you know, being able to bring the price down uh, to a reasonable level and uh, make sure that it's involved would be uh, useful as well. The third uh, issue is that uh, with pain management, um, can the person actually um, uh, metabolize the pain medicine so that it works? So for example, many of the, uh, um, medicines that are in the opiate class are pro drugs that require uh, uh, activation before they take their effect. And so that uh, if they have those variants, they can't uh, have any benefit, but they do have the side effects of, of the medication. And uh, so those, those things were all uh, important as well. But I think that uh, uh, to see whether or not uh, he's had a rising glucose and uh, that amount of weight loss really is uh, concerning for pancreatic cancer. Great. All right. So um, let's see a show of hands um, who audience participation too, please. Who um, thinks, so we've optimized him medically. He's quit smoking. Um, maybe we plus minus genetic testing. He's on pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. He's gained a little bit of weight back. He doesn't have a cancer. What's the next step? Who's, who's ready to take him to the operating room? His pain is persistent. All right, what's the weight? Nick, go ahead. Ready to take him to the OR? Yeah. I don't know. I think this is a really tough one because small duct disease, he's already diabetic. He's it's not gonna be useful to um, you know, to reinfuse the islets for TPIAT. Um, I would just hope he gets better when he stops smoking and potentially go down the avenue of more longer term uh, medical management, even, you know, up to and including pancreas rest, if you will, with 
tube feeding and or TPN even for a period of time. I mean, th the other thing to consider is that this is a long game. You know, mm -hmm. we, we're, you know, this is an audience of surgeons. And I think that, um, that Dr. Wickham is right. It's a little scary to be in this room. We want to fix people and we want to do something right away. But, you know, this is a years and years and years long process. And on one hand, you don't want to wait too long if there's a clear indication. But on the other hand, you know, you may hurt somebody by doing uh, poorly designed operation. So it's interesting. You said he's already diabetic. So I don't think I mentioned that. Um, but so let's say he is diabetic, um, but on just a little bit of insulin and he has C peptide function. Is that, does that mean you wouldn't, that, does that change your decision making in terms of islet transplant? And I think I'll let Dr. Um, Kirshner. Uh, I was, yes. I yeah. think that it would be good to test the C peptide actually and see whether or not, because the goal of here doing auto islet, not only going to be insulin independence, it's to avoid the brittle diabetes. So if, okay, if there, yeah. Um, and then we have, we have audience comments. <laughs> we have comments from the audience. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Nilan. First of all, great panel. I know way too much about this disease. Uh, you'll be happy to know since I was Darth Vader for Katie for many years about TPIT that now I've done it, I actually get Christmas cards. <laughs> Very happy for patients. Yes. My real belief is it's a different population. But but I will say that it's not a dead end for me for small duct. First of all, Jakob is Bicky in the 1990s, late 1990s, came up with what he called a V-shaped excavation of the body and head of the pancreas with a drainage procedure with good success. The other thing that I'll say now that we have the fry is that if you really don't, you really can find that duct, once you place your sutures around the C loop of the head of the pancreas, which I do all the time, I learned that from Baker, and then you do your excavation, you'll, you'll find the duct in the head. And then once you do that, you can retrograde, find your way into the body to duct. So there's a way, in my opinion, even in small duct to do duct drainage. Great. So it sounds like Dr. Neilan, our expert, um, would do a drainage procedure. Um, I think Nick brought up the, and Dr. Kirshner brought up the islet, a total pancreatectomy with islet transplant, which classically this is small duct disease, but this guy's an alcoholic. Um, he's recovered, but he's alcohol pancreatitis. And so I think um, we know that that disease doesn't do as well with total pancreatectomy and islet transplant. So does that change your decision making? Um I I think it's going to be a long like social work you know kind of visit even if and I would still give him a chance if the rest of the multidisciplinary group would feel that this is appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, the concern is the extent of the disease. The second MRI is that I showed you with a jump graft was from a patient like this, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and it was yeah uh, it was it was a complicated case. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. Well, good. Well. So let's see a show of hands. Who would do, a, if, if once we get him to the operating room, assuming he goes there, who would do a total pancreatectomy islet transplant for this patient? No one. How about who would do a drainage procedure? Can you on? One person. Um, what about a pancreatic head resection? One. So no, no one wants to operate on this guy. Yeah, Mr. Bodie. I, I mean, if this, if he's got C-peptide, I think the way to go is a TBIT. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Can I ask a quick yeah. question, Katie? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious for the audience and the panel members who has TPIAT available at their centers and how does that incorporate into the decision making? Raise your hand if you have either an islet transplant center or access to one. All right. What about, does anyone refer that doesn't have access, do they refer their patients? I routinely refer my patients, um, even though we have zero centers in uh, my state where I currently work or where I worked before, but I routinely refer my patients for TPIAT often to Katie. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, next case. See. So this is a 23 year old woman who, um, has had a six year history now of episodic abdominal pain, um, about two times per year where she ends up in the hospital with pancreatitis. She now has a uh, persistent pain, um, for about three months, a smoldering kind of course with PO intolerance. 
She has no family history of pancreatitis, um, but she underwent genetic testing and it, it does have a um, CFTR mutation um, that's read as of, of undetermined significance. Um, I guess we can go off the bat with Dr. Whitcomb. What, do you, what does that mean when they come back with that indeterminate significance to you? Well, um, we know that a lot of patients, we, we never do figure out what's going on with them and they're idiopathic. Um, the uh, other problem with sequencing is you end up with a lot of variants of unknown significance and those are uh, ones that you worry about, but you don't know what to do with it as well. Uh, the fact that she does not have, I assume, other uh, genetic variants um, uh, that have been identified, and I'm not sure how extensive her uh, uh, evaluation was, um, you know, is going to be uh, um, important as well. Uh, so, um, if if she if she does have uh, abnormal CFTR function, which uh, there are variants that nobody finds where there's a, a uh, mutations in the uh, gene expressing or gene regulatory elements. Uh, it's not in the uh, uh, sequencing area, or excuse me, the uh, exons. Uh, so as many times they'll have a diminished CFTR function and um, uh, that may be contributing to as well. So uh, we've been trying to encourage people to do uh, some function test of CFTR if that's the, the, um, the main thing they've seen. Sometimes it can be seen with a sweat uh, chloride, for example. Uh, so um, I don't know what she has. <laughs> okay. So these are images and I'll just point out, so this is a, um, an axial MR and you can see her duct. Um, do I have a, is this a, I don't think I have a pointer, but um, the, the middle image shows a, if you look, she's got a, obviously she's got a dilated duct throughout her pancreas. The, in the middle there, she's got a, a 1.8 centimeter stone um, lodged in the neck of her pancreas. And um, in the upper left corner shows that she's got a pretty beefy head of pancreas as well. So she's got a beefy head of pancreas, a, a dilated duct, and she's got a, a large pancreatic duct stone. Um, this is a young patient. Um, we're suspicious she has some level of a hereditary disease. Um, let's see. Who in the panel wants to answer this? What, what do we want to do for her? So her, her disease, we've done all the interventions. She has persistent pain um, and she, she really um, would do well with some form of inter surgical intervention to get better. Um, what are the thoughts from the panel? Well, I think that in, the, in this case, the Paddington Rochelle procedure may be a good option for her. Hyperoscopic, maybe. I think that she has pain and the dilation of the Wilson duct, so the, the compression surgery will be the choice in, in, in my hospital. Anyone disagree? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I think you said TPIT. Is that right? Total pancreatectomy? Is that what you said? No, no. Okay. Um, the, the, idea of uh, the compression procedure, a part in turn, Rochelle, hyperoscopic. No. Okay. Yeah. I think a, a, a fry operation would be nice here, or depending on the anatomy, you know, to get the stone out, do a lateral PJ core of the head. I think okay. that would be nice. A CFTR um, mutation in isolation, again, I, that doesn't make me quite as worried about progressive recurrent pancreatitis, but she's a young woman. I'd like to try to spare the duodenum as long as there's no duodenal compressive symptoms or okay. very compressive symptoms. What about you, Dr. Kirshner? Do you want to do a total pancreatectomy? Actually, my first thought was that so there are no endoscopic uh, av available <laughs> options. Yeah, the stone's almost two centimeters in size in the pancreatic. Exactly. Okay. Well, I think I think I would I, I would have to again discuss it in the multidisciplinary panel because w their concern is young woman with potential mutation, potential recurrence, and doing the drainage procedure just prolongs the, you know, will will still contribute to recurrent of symptoms eventually, potentially. So, right. but, and what, loss of endocrine function. So, mm -hmm. okay. So what if I, what if her genetic testing had shown PRSS1 positive disease? Would everyone in the panel go for total pancreatectomy at that point? Yeah. Considering she's this young. Yeah. But, what about if she had a SPINK1 mutation? 
um, is that change to, does that change the algorithm for anyone? So no PR, she's PRSS one negative, but she's got SPINK one and CFTR. Dr. Whitcomb. What should we do, Dr. Whitcomb? Well, really, the, the decision is driven by her clinical symptoms. I think the uh, um, the fact if, if she does have some of the stronger mutations, um, the problem is not going to be solved with uh, drainage alone. It's going to continue and, and progress. So a uh, decision about whether or not to do a TPIT uh, at some point sooner or later, I think, is, is really the main consideration. All right. Well, you have someone. I'm by no means an expert on these uh, genetics, but uh, in a patient that's 23 years old um, with an unexplained uh, mechanism of pancreatitis, I would be concerned, although I think it's appropriate to do, as Dr. Zaromsky alluded to, a, a drainage uh, operation combined with some form of resection. I think that's that's palliative and we don't really understand what's going on. And I would be concerned that she would have recurrent symptoms and ultimately perhaps require a total pancreatectomy, in which case, if she's had a prior pancreat pancreatic operation, her outcome after total pancreatectomy will probably be worse. And so that would be at least why I would hesitate a bit to proceed directly to a, a you know an anatomic operation. I have a patient kind of exactly like the one you just mentioned with the SPINK1 and CFTR mutation who had multiple stones throughout, but we were actually able to get all her stones out endoscopically. Um, even though there, some of them were one and a half centimeters. Um, and I put her on pancreas enzyme replacement therapy. She wants to finish college, um, and kind of get a few more years under her belt and she hasn't had any recurrent symptoms. So we, she and I do imaging every six months right now and, uh, have video visits and she's been doing great for about a year and a half. Um, so eventually she understands the goal will be to go to TPIAT, but she just isn't quite there yet. Okay. Great. So, so I think, you know, salient to this specific case, there's a couple of really important things. Number one is the endoscopic thing. Mm -hmm. And if you, if your, if your ERCP guys can do S wall and get the stone out, then yes, for sure. This is somebody who can, who can treat that. And then the question is, what does the underlying stricture look like? Because there's a dominant problem in this young woman. It's probably not cancer because she's 23. But this is something, you know, the anatomy is very favorable, I think, for a drainage procedure because there's one clear problem, you know, and it and just a single genetic mutation doesn't make me worry that much. But let me ask you, Katie, yeah. I mean, you're probably the expert on this DS about what are the specific genetic mutations that would make you worry and push you more towards TPIT rather than a, um, a drainage operation. I mean, I... I Again, I'm I'm not a I'm not David Whitcomb with in terms of my knowledge or understanding of the genetics, but the only clear answer for me is the PRSS1 positive patients. Those are the only patients we really know um, will ultimately end up at total pancreatectomy. Um, so I think those that's that's the right answer. Um, there there seem to be these patients that have the heterogene or heterozygous um, SPINK1 mutations with something else that also demonstrate a very progressive form of disease. Um, so that that to me is is level two worry. Um, but a CFTR mutation, even one that's significant, wouldn't change my algorithm. Well, I think we're getting close to time. Um, and then Danielle's going to give us a review of the evidence. All right. Thank you so much to the panel and to everyone for sticking it out. I promise to keep this short and sweet and simple um, and hopefully tie together some of the, um, the themes throughout all of the other panelists' talks. So as we've discussed, chronic pancreatitis is an inflammatory disorder that's characterized by replacement of the pancreatic parenchyma with fibrous connective tissue. The most common sequelae include debilitating pain and progressive exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. We've discussed some of the etiologies and risk factors and whatever is modifiable is critical to modify early in the disease course. 40 to 75% of these patients ultimately undergo surgery and the management is dictated by the anatomy of the pancreatic duct and the morphology of the gland. So in broad terms, we can kind of classify disease into dilated duct and non-dilated ducts. 
So for patients that have a dilated main pancreatic duct, I think endoscopic therapy is a reasonable first choice for patients who have a clear-cut duct obstruction with a reasonably sized stone or a stricture within the pancreatic head or somewhere that's accessible for endoscopic management. You have to know as you go into this that patients are, who are managed endoscopically will oftentimes require multiple procedures and that from the outset, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary management is really key to ensure patients get the best care. The largest study um, sort of supporting um, some of the benefit of potential endoscopic management comes from the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy Research Group, which looked at just over 1,000 patients with a mean five-year follow-up. In that study, two-thirds of the patients had relief of pain with endoscopic management alone, and 24% of them ultimately required surgery. This study included eight expert centers, so there was some concern back in 2002 when this was published that this wouldn't necessarily be re reproducible uh, in other less experienced centers. Around the same time, two other randomized controlled trials were also enrolling patients, one um, from the Czech Republic published in 2003, which randomized 140 patients to either surgery, which included 80% resections and 20% drainage procedures versus endotherapy, which included sphincterotomy and stenting in 52% and stone removal in 23%. The short-term outcomes were similar, but five-year um, complete absence of pain was better in the surgery group, 37% versus 14%. Another randomized trial from the Netherlands included 39 patients who were randomized to endoscopic therapy versus surgical drainage with a lateral pancreatic ojejunostomy. And in this study, they were both better short and long-term pain control in the surgical group. In the more modern era, the Dutch pancreatitis group in the form of the ESCAPE trial gave more, um, um, uh, showed more of the benefit to a, a surgical approach. This study randomized um, <clears throat> patients to either early surgery with a drainage procedure versus endoscopic management and demonstrated improvement in their, um, their primary endpoint, which was pain scores at 18 months. Pain relief in this study was 58% in the surgical group versus 39% in the endoscopy first group. Median number of procedures in the surgical group was one compared with three in the endoscopy group, and there was no difference in complications or hospital admissions or quality of life. With respect to drainage procedures, we typically, again, need a dilated pancreatic duct that measures at least six or seven millimeters so that it can be easily found, except um, Dr. Nealon may disagree with this, but in general, I think that's relatively uh, accepted. Um, pain relief after a lateral, lateral pancreatic ojejunostomy is reported in the range of 48 to 91% with a complication range in the range of 20%. A FRI modification with local resection of the pancreatic head or so-called coring of the pancreatic head can be added to this to re reduce the risk of recurrence of pain uh, with pain relief um, reported to be in the 62 to 91% range with a slight increase in the morbidity given the increased complexity of this operation compared with a lateral PJ. Then when we talk about non-dilated pancreatic ducts, if the patient goes on to, uh, to an operative intervention, surgical resection is typically what can be offered. And what is offered is basically dictated by the pattern of disease. So if a patient has head dominant disease, the options are really duodenal preserving pancreatic head resection versus a pancreatoduodenectomy. Uh, it's been debated which of these two approaches is better. Uh, multiple studies have evaluated this. Um, the most recent study being the crow trial in 2017, which was a multi-center trial that randomized patients to do a denal preserving pancreatic head resection versus a Whipple. There was no difference in the primary endpoint, which is quality of life at 24 months and no difference in serious adverse events. So really in deciding between these uh, two operations, it really comes down to surgeon experience and comfort, any patient specific anatomical factors, as well as whether there's any concern for malignancy, the extent of involvement in the duodenum, um, whether or not there's any group pancreatitis. Patients with body and tail dominant disease or candidates for a potential distal pancreatectomy and those with the diffuse parenchymal involvement are best served with a total pancreatectomy, hopefully with auto islet uh, transplantation. With respect to total pancreatectomy, again, patient selection, as with all of this, is really the key. Uh, auto islet transplantation mitigates the risk of brittle, brittle diabetes and is the preferred approach for patients with chronic pancreatitis. And still strategies are needed to improve long-term outcomes and increase the rates of insulin independence. 
So in conclusion, the goals of therapy for treating patients with chronic pancreatitis are durable pain relief and preservation of pancreatic function. Endoscopic management is often reasonable as a first step for patients who have amenable anatomy, um, but multidisciplinary management is really key from the beginning. Early surgical management leads to better outcomes, again, in appropriately selected patients. Oncologic resection is clearly the favored approach if there's a concern for malignancy or there's an inability to rule out malignancy. Uh, and total pancreatectomy uh, with eyelid autotransplant relieves pain and improves quality of life in well-selected adults and children with chronic pancreatitis. So I will end there. Thank you very much again to all of the panelists. This was an amazing panel. And uh, thank you to the audience for sticking it out late on a Saturday evening. I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and safe travels home. <laughs>